It's not easy being Belarus, flat by terrain, with no geographic barriers, not to mention landlocked, and sharing a lengthy land border with the powerful Russian Federation. The fact that Belarus has maintained its de jure independence is an acknowledgement in its own right. For centuries the country was perceived as nothing more than a highway for traversing armies. At various points in its history, Minsk reluctantly played part in the tug of war between West and East. Though the Belarus of today is still seen as little more than an extension of Russia, lawmakers in Minsk have recently begun exploring for ways to escape the clutch of the Kremlin. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Working with digital files always carries risks. Nordlocker is an app that encrypts your data so you can keep them securely on your computer, cloud or whenever you're sending files to others. It's one of the easiest apps that I've come across. A simple drag and drop is all it takes to encrypt your documents. Visit nordlocker.net slash Caspian report. The first two gigabytes is free and if you like the app, use the promo code Caspian report to get a discount on the premium version. Located in Eastern Europe and widely referred to as Europe's last dictatorship, Belarus occupies an area of vast strategic importance as part of Russia's near abroad. The country emerged from the breakup of the Soviet Union as one of the most steadfast allies of the Russian Federation. Under the leadership of Alexander Lukashenko, who has governed Belarus since 1994 and is seeking re-election in August 2020 for his sixth term, Minsk consistently worked to integrate the economy of Belarus with Russia. This included modeling the Belarusian government upon the legacy of the Soviet Union, including its cultural identity and national symbols. While strong economic, cultural and geostrategic ties bind Belarus and Russia, Lukashenko is now entertaining the idea of pursuing greater independence from Moscow. In recent years, he has developed relations with new partners and seems to be following an increasingly multi-vector strategy in the goal of reducing Belarus's dependency on its overbearing neighbor. This dependency cannot be underestimated, as almost 40% of Belarusian trade is conducted with Russia. More importantly, Belarus is dependent on Russian oil, which is processed in two major facilities located in Mazir and Novopolotsk, both in Belarus. Refined oil products make up more than half of the value of Belarusian exports to the European Union. So by dominating the Belarusian oil industry, Russia maintains substantial economic leverage over Belarus. The Kremlin's grip over Belarus goes back decades. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia propped up the Belarusian economy with loans and energy subsidies. Over the years, these subsidies saved Minsk hundreds of millions of dollars and thus brought stability to the government of Lukashenko. Now, however, Russia's financial commitments is in retreat due to pressure from the US sanctions and falling hydrocarbon prices. With resources stretched thinly, Putin has begun to tighten the screws by introducing a new supply framework. In December 2019, Russia and Belarus failed to renegotiate a new oil price for the year 2020, and so Moscow began to cut supplies. This sudden reduction in subsidies resulted in Belarusian imports dropping by one-third in the month of January. In turn, this forced Minsk to dip into its own reserves as well as seek deliveries of Norwegian and Azerbaijani hydrocarbons via the Baltic and Black Seas. With Belarus in desperate need of crude oil, the Americans have entered the market as well. In February, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in Minsk and expressed interest in supplementing the Belarusian oil supply. Still, despite international competition, the Russians remain confident that their crude oil remains a bargain, even with reduced subsidies. Which makes sense given the difficulty of sourcing oil from the Middle East, the Caspian Sea, the North Sea and the American markets. So it's likely that Moscow will maintain considerable leverage in dictating policy to Minsk. 
Hydrocarbon dependency is part of the explanation, geopolitics is the other half of the reason. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, economic and military integration has been one of Russia's primary policy aims with Belarus. The two countries signed a major treaty towards the establishment of a union state in December 1999, which was to include a common customs policy, free movement of goods and people, as well as a common currency. The union state would have served as a precedent for the integration of other Soviet successor states, mimicking supranatural institutions like the European Union. Regardless, interest in the union state concept has waned significantly over the years, with increasing numbers of Belarusian citizens signaling vocal opposition to the plan. Now, Belarusian opposition to the union state represents a cultural shift in the public sphere as more and more citizens seek to distance themselves culturally and socially from the legacy of the Soviet Union. This is a profound transition. Of all the post-Soviet states, Belarus may have the weakest cultural identity due to efforts to actively Russify the country under Lukashenko. For instance, use of the Belarusian language was actually discouraged and Belarusian schoolchildren were taught a history that emphasized the founding role of the Soviet Union. In recent years, however, this cultural policy has shifted. The Belarusian language is increasingly taught at schools and the curriculum has expanded beyond Soviet history. While in the past opposition activists were detained for displaying Belarusian nationalist symbols such as the former white-red-white white flag of Belarus or the Pohonia coat of arms, now, however, symbols of Belarusian nationalism are allowed more openly. In the game of geopolitics, symbols matter, and Lukashenko may be slowly aiming to decouple Belarus's cultural consciousness away from Russian influence. This cultural awakening accelerated following Russia's annexation of Crimea, whose overwhelming Russian-speaking population largely accepted Putin's takeover of the region. For Lukashenko, Crimea was a warning sign. Given the universal presence of the Russian language in Belarus proper, Lukashenko may have believed that certain regions may be more willing to defy the central government in Minsk by siding with Moscow. Fears that Russian-backed separatists could destabilize the Belarusian state are not without merit, especially given recent developments in Ukraine. For Putin, meanwhile, maintaining a military presence in Belarus is paramount. Given the NATO presence in the Baltic states and Poland, as well as the colored revolutions in Georgia and Ukraine, Putin is justifiably apprehensive of Western encroachment into Russia's sphere of influence. For the Russians, Belarus presents both a buffer against possible Western encroachment as well as a forward strategic position from which to launch possible operations. Check out our report on the Baltic states for more on this. Belarus is also strategically located near the Kaliningrad Oblast, which is Russia's westernmost territory sandwiched between Poland and Lithuania. The 2017 Zapad joint exercise between Russia and Belarus resulted in major troop deployments in the Kaliningrad Oblast and the Grodno province of Belarus, and heightened NATO apprehensions about possible Russian belligerents in the Baltics. In response, NATO member states, such as Poland, have significantly increased military spending and troop presence in the region. Warsaw has also requested that a permanent American base named Fort Trump be stationed in the country. Polish soft power in the region is a major concern of supporters of the Russian-Belarusian Union State concept. The relative strength of the Polish economy has attracted Belarusian immigration and supplied cheap, duty-free goods in the other direction. NGOs and radio stations in Warsaw regularly publish material in support of Belarusian nationalists and those critical of Lukashenko. These actions, along with issuing Polish identification cards to a large number of Belarusians of both real and alleged Polish descent, has displeased both Minsk and Moscow. 
This is particularly alarming when considering that Poland used to reign over vast territories now belonging to Belarus. The western Grodno province of Belarus, with its sizable Roman Catholic and nationalist-oriented population, is often considered a hotbed for foreign interference. So while Russia exploited the Russian identity of Crimea to annex that territory from Ukraine, Poland has the tools and motive to exploit Belarusian nationalism. Two can play the game of identity politics. So in time, Poland will likely expand its support to Belarusian nationalist organizations with Western support for Ukrainian nationalists serving as the president. By now, it is clear that Lukashenko is playing a double game, relying both on Russian energy while at the same time seeking to diversify his options. For instance, while Russian military activity on Belarusian soil has grown over the years, Lukashenko has also recently signaled that he is unwilling to cede sovereignty by refusing to host a new Russian Air Force base. At the same time, Belarus has been lobbying for other military partners, including China. After failing to secure additional loans from Russia, Lukashenko made a deal with his Chinese counterpart for a loan worth $500 million. These additional funds give Minsk greater room to maneuver and can be used in the future to enhance trade relations with East Asia. Beyond China and Poland, Lukashenko has also been strengthening ties with the European Union. While in the past the EU dismissed Belarus as a puppet state, in recent years the diplomatic relations between the two have entered a new phase of cooperation. One example is the Eastern Partnership Agreement, which has worked to enhance political and economic cooperation between the EU and post-Soviet states in regions such as Ukraine, Moldova and the Caucasus. The pro-EU agreement was signed in 2009, a year after Russia's military intervention into Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Belarus's refusal to match Russia's recognition of the two breakaway Georgian states indicates that Minsk is willing to follow an independent foreign policy from Moscow, even if that policy is only modestly independent. And while Lukashenko has acknowledged that Crimea is de facto part of Russia, Belarus has not officially recognized Crimea as part of the Russian Federation. Moves such as these represent a form of strategic hedging on the part of Minsk, which has allowed the EU to forge closer ties with Belarus. Following Russia's military intervention in Ukraine, Belarus further separated its foreign policy from Russia by claiming strategic neutrality. Yes, Belarus has a lot going on. The state is bargaining with new energy suppliers and reaching out to China, while the public is undergoing a cultural awakening and Polish soft power is steadily growing in the western provinces. Relations with the European Union is improving and even the Americans are now making an offer. Yet, for all the advances made in recent years, the Minsk government remains profoundly vulnerable to Russian pressure. Belarus is in no shape or state to defy Russian security imperatives on its soil. It lacks the geography, manpower, diplomatic know-how, and its economy retains the inefficiencies from the Soviet era. If Ukraine is any indication, the potential for secessionist conflict exists in Belarus as well. More importantly, there are domestic mechanisms in Belarus that keep its lawmakers from drifting away from Russia's orbit. Lukashenko remains at the helm of the government because he produces stability. That stability, however, is due to favorable economic relations with Russia, including the energy and social subsidies, the generous loans, etc., all financed by Moscow. So ultimately, Lukashenko, being a man of stability, cannot rock the boat. At best, Minsk can use foreign ties to renegotiate terms with Moscow and gain better concessions. But geopolitical realities on the ground dictate that Belarus will remain in wedlock with Russia for the foreseeable future. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you enjoyed this report, leave a comment, subscribe and hit the like button. Thank you for watching and Seoul.